Recording. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kelsey Nichols, and I am the Community Engagement Coordinator with Reforest London. Many of you may have seen me before uh, at last week's orientation training or um, get my email because I'm the volunteer coordinator. Um, so welcome to Tree Specialist 101. Uh, we're so happy you could join us. Um, we're so excited that there's so much interest in this training. Um, and our project manager, Juliana, is going to be leading it today. So if you want to go to the next slide. Um, and I'll just mention too, so when you entered, um, you were automatically muted. Um, you can have your video on or, or not, it's up to you. Um, and we just prefer that you stay muted. And then if you have any questions throughout, you can put them in the chat box. Um, and so feel free to ask questions anytime. Um, and we'll just talk away and do some polls. And uh, we are recording. So if you can't stay the whole time in the next day or two, I'll send out the recording. Okay, so uh, before we dive in, I just want to talk about us a little bit. So um, you may know about Reforest London as being a tree planting organization, um, but we're also the founders of the new Westminster Pond Center for Environment and Sustainability. So launched in October 2019, um, it's going to be a huge project where we're renovating some heritage buildings in order to hold programs and, and services that um, are all about anything environment and, and sustainability related. Um, so eventually we're going to be holding a lot of educational uh, events there, um, but in the meantime we're hosting events such as these online because of the pandemic. Um, so all these educational programs are under the umbrella of the Signal Boost Initiative, which is uh, the program that um, I coordinate. And I just want to mention that this program is supported by uh, Canada Life. Well, all of Reforest London is supported by Canada Life and um, it's sponsored by the Ontario Trillium Foundation. All right. So if you enjoy the training tonight, um, certainly you want to do the part two, which is an in-person hike. Um, I know that a lot of people have already signed up, so you'll want to reserve your spot. Um, so that one's going to be on Thursday, September 24th. And so that's the next step in the training. Now, there's a lot of people that signed up tonight and we're limiting it to about 20 spots for the hike. So if there ends up being more interest than there are spots, um, we may consider offering a second, second hike. Um, but yeah, we're also uh, hosting a lot of other um, just diverse educational events uh, really over the next couple of years. But right now, the ones that are coming up are uh, one tomorrow is called Coloring Nature, and it's put on by the Thames Tablet Land Trust, and it's a panel discussion all about um, racial and environmental justice, the intersection of both. Um, and then there's a couple of workshops. One is a webinar and one is a full day workshop all about permaculture. So those are coming up as well. And so we're also adding new events to the calendar all the time. So if you want, you can go to reforestlondon.ca to check it out um, under the workshops page. Um, and if you ever have any questions about things like that, workshops, educational events, trainings, um, you can let me know at signalboost at reforestlondon.ca. All right, so I will be watching the chat box throughout and Juliana um, will be presenting, so I will pass it over to her. All right, thanks everyone for joining us. I'm super excited about giving this presentation. I, I love trees and I love having people volunteer and come on out and help us at our events. So uh, this is just a quick little breakdown. It's a lengthy slideshow, but um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so we're gonna talk about a little bit about the Million Tree Challenge. We're talking about what it means to be a tree specialist. Um, what is a tree and what's a forest? Uh, the forest city itself, how to plant and care for a tree, park plantings, uh, tree depots, other programs that we offer through Forest London, um, and uh, kind of like a nice quick summary at the very end, okay? All right, so a little bit about Reforest London. Uh, so we were founded uh, by citizens in 2005 as a part of the um, United London. Uh, since then, we've planted over 70,000 trees and shrubs with the help of over 50,000 volunteers, um, and we've completed over 300 projects. Uh, so today, Reforest London is made up of 10 staff. 
Um, and our goal, we have our, our goal of the three E's. So our main initiative is the Million Tree Challenge. So the Million Tree Challenge, the goal of the Million Tree Challenge um, is to plant uh, one million trees, um, any species planted by anyone, anywhere within the city of London. So that includes anyone who is a gardener, anyone who's a landscape or runs a landscaping business. Those trees can be counted um, on the milliontreechallenge.ca website. So we encourage everyone who has ever planted a tree to please make sure that they um, get to take advantage of, of adding their tree to the Million Tree Challenge to help London reach its goal of one million trees. All right, so a sense of scale. So the total size of London is approximately 42,000 hectares. Uh, at 1,080 tree, um, that's a sapling. Uh, that's how many saplings you can fit per hectare. We would need uh, 926 hectare, hectares of London to reach our goal. So that's 2% of the land. So that's the equivalent to 154 Victoria Parks or 50 White Oaks Malls or um, six of the University of Water of uh, Western uh, main campuses. So this is um, a map of the London proper, and this is like what it would look like um, if we were to try and plant one million trees in that little section. So this is the uh, Million Tree uh, Challenge website. So we want to make London uh, healthier and leafier by planting trees. So you can register your trees and become a tree partner. So this is a current snapshot of the website. And so the website uh, is currently reading uh, 45,000, uh, sorry, 452,312 uh, trees um, planted uh, to date. So that's wonderful. So again, if you're looking to add your trees um, to the Million Tree Challenge, we always encourage people, sometimes it's a, a last minute thought, but it's really important that we uh, get all these trees counted. So you can register your trees um, at milliontreechallenge.ca or you can head to the Reforest London uh, website and we, are, we have a page dedicated just to the Million Tree Challenge. All right, so a little bit about the uh, canopy cover here. So the, uh, today's canopy cover in uh, London is about 24%. The city of London, um, the urban forest strategy has a goal of 28% of canopy cover by 2035, 34% canopy cover by 2065. So the city of London's goal um, also includes a tree planting strategy. So the way to achieve our 34% uh, of canopy cover, we, we would need to plant over uh, 2,430 hectares and just over 2.4 million um, more medium-sized shade trees. So um, some of the challenges is that 89% of London is private land and 89% of those trees would have to go on private land, which is why the Million Tree Challenge is such a great initiative. So combined, you need an average of citywide uh, 50,000 trees per year for 50 years. So it's definitely uh, something that we are working towards um, in uh, partnership with the City of London. So a little bit about tree specialist volunteers. So everyone um, is, is enjoying uh, being a part. We are looking for people who like to do outdoor um, uh, activities. Um, extra experience and knowledge and the love of trees is always is a great bonus. Uh, we love higher level of engagement and at special events and hike leader training um, that is happening this fall. So um, tree specialist volunteers are needed at park naturalizations, tree depots, and aftercare. Those are all events that um, tree specialist volunteers can come out and assist with. So a little bit about the training. So it is a four-step process. One, the in-class session, which we are all in attendance today. Um, our tree ID hike, which we have scheduled for September 24th. Again, that's a pre-registration, so you need to register in advance. We're holding the capacity at 20 people, but if there is um, more people that are interested in signing up, we will look at um, hosting a second date. And the third part of the training includes completing the online quiz. And then the fourth part is attending a planting event. And we do have quite a few planting events happening this fall, so there's no worry when it comes to uh, ticking that box off. All right, so the um, community engagement uh, coordinator is your contact person all about being a tree specialist, all right? So you can reach them at volunteer at reforestlinen.ca. That was Kelsey that was speaking before. Um, Kelsey will send out uh, calls for the tree specialists 
um, to be posted on um, for a volunteer spot. So we're looking to fill those um, spots after you've completed training. So the website that we use is signup.com. Um, so you're going to look for the tree specialist events tab, which is usually located here at the bottom. You click on that and then a, a calendar will pop up with the available spots um, that, you, that are open and we are looking for volunteers to fill. All right, so at all of the events, we are looking for uh, tree specialists to sign in. So please wear your RFL t-shirt uh, um, or we will provide a safety vest so that people, the general public can be easily um, identify Reforest London staff and Reforest London volunteers. Um, there are 15 events. Uh, we got three gallon trees in Celebration Forest. Um, and then there's also, after you've completed 15 events, sorry, you get, you are gifted a, a tree. And after 30 events, you are gifted a $50 uh, gift card to Mac. So um, as you are ticking off the amount of events that you volunteer at, there are some you know, um, thank you gifts that are reciprocated to you for your time because um, we really value volunteers at Reforest London. With a staff of 10, we wouldn't be able to do all the work that we do. All right, so the question is, what is a tree? So tree in all different shapes and sizes. Um, there are, all three of these trees are actually dogwoods, so they are different kinds of trees, the same genus, um, but gene as, which mean they are genetically similar, uh, but um, the height, they differ in height. Um, they also differ in their woody materials. They differ in their diameter when it comes to how uh, wide around the uh, trunk is on the tree. The number of stems can differ. So on the bottom left corner is a red osier dogwood and they can have multiple stems, whereas a flowering dogwood can uh, very uh, often come as a single stem tree. All right, so for the purpose of the Million Tree Challenge, um, all individuals of the same species um, need to be perennials and have woody stems. Um, and individuals of the same species typically reach um, a height of at least 4.5 4 meters or more if left untrimmed. So the photo uh, here is showing um, an eastern white cedar. And so eastern white cedars are very commonly used in the city as hedges, but if they are left untrimmed, they can grow to be almost um, over uh, 20 or 30 feet tall. All right, so uh, what is a native tree? So native trees for the purpose of the MTC um, challenge is that um, a native tree is defined as a tree um, species which naturally occurs in Ontario prior to European settlement. So not all trees which are native to Ontario naturally occur in the London area. Um, so that we just want to keep that in mind when we're looking at what we're planting to count towards our million tree challenge. All right. So what is a forest? A type of terrestrial ecosystem dominated by trees is the basic definition of, a, of what is a forest. But forests do change based off of being urban or rural forests. There are many different organisms that live and coexist within a forest. There are many different layers from within a forest. So the layers can, they um, vary from the canopy, the very tops of a tree to the understory, um, down to the shrub and sapling layer, which are usually quite shaded in a forest. And they also actually includes the ground cover layer. So uh, forests can very often include swamps and savannas. So canopy cover versus woodland cover. On the left, uh, the percentage of ground area underneath the tree um, that the crown covers is considered canopy cover. Any and all trees, standalone group plantings, forests, etc., all have canopy cover. And they actually include woodland cover where woodland cover is the percentage of ground covered by woodland area, naturalized tree habitat. So it's an area that has been naturalized. Um, it has kind of, it's taken on a form of its own and it's not like just a standalone tree. Um, it does not include cover provided by standalone trees. So woodland cover does not include that wide range um, of canopy cover. 
All right, so this photo here is showing you that the uh, uh, a tree that would be planted and the canopy cover it would give. So the um, inner circle, that's innermost circle, is a, a canopy cover of a tree that has been planted um, in its first year and the canopy cover it provides. By the year 2035, the canopy has grown to cover more than 26 meters squared, uh, and that's the um, amount of area that that canopy now covers. And then by 2065, which is that 50 year peak that we're looking, the max canopy cover could cover um, for a medium shade tree over 176 meters squared. So the lesson here that we wanna take away from this is that the sooner that we plant the trees, um, the sooner they can grow and the sooner they can help um, cover that, that can't get, um, help us achieve that canopy cover that we're looking. Okay, so trees in the forest city. Um, today, in the urban area, we have 4.4 million trees. That means there are 12 trees per person, and our current canopy cover in London is 24%. Uh, in Ontario, we have forest cover that has been reduced from 80% to 11%, and that is due to um, uh, urban sprawl. So forest and climate change. So the benefits of, of having forests, we've all heard this before, um, that forests, they uptake the CO2 during photosynthesis and then exhale the oxygen and keep that carbon stored in their trunk and within their leaves. Um, it also helps when it comes to 90% less solar radiation. So the sun is, hits the, the tree and then is reflected back. So we're not getting that direct uh, radiation from the sun. Uh, so some concerns that we have, there's um, increased um, uh, degradation to our forests. Uh, new pests and in, uh, invasion of invasive species is taking a toll on our forests. Um, and we really want to look at how reforest London can help in the uh, reforestation um, of areas and connecting corridors, keeping our, our forests healthy. All right, so a little bit about our restoration ecology. So restoration ecology is the process of assisting uh, the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. Um, Ontario's tree cover has been reduced, like I said earlier, from 80 to 11 percent, leaving lots of room for restoration ecology to help um, and to uh, create more forests. Uh, the London's current canopy cover uh, is around 23 percent, but the city is aiming to increase to 28 percent by 2035. Restoration has the potential to generate an additional forest habitat, provide buffer zones for pre-existing habitat, and to increase the connectivity of many um, patchy forests within the city. So it's really important that the, the restoration efforts can continue to help create those green spaces within um, these broken and patchy areas. Restoration is not a quick process by any means. Um, it can be a long process for forests and it can take up to 100 years to match the high quality of um, reference sites that we're hoping to achieve. So it's definitely not something that can be done overnight um, and it takes years to achieve um, a healthy uh, thriving forest. All right, so the question is always, why do we want to plant native? Um, planting native has many benefits. One of the many benefits is low maintenance. So these, these uh, native trees um, are already adapted to the area. Once they are established, native species require little upkeep because they have, they're meant to be here. They've been here for thousands of years and they will continue to be here. Um, so they're great because they don't need a lot of um, tending to. They ha are beautiful, uh, as many people know. Many native species offer uh, showy flowers, uh, beautiful seasonal color changes, which are happening very soon. Um, they are great for conserving water because they've already adapted to the area. They require less water than a non-native species. So they don't require uh, um, taking water from seasonal flooding areas, but they can, can thrive on just the right amount of water because they, they don't need that extra bit of tending to. Uh, they're be a great benefit for wildlife. Not only are they providing habitat, but native species have co-evolved and have coexisted with these native trees. 
They um, have coexisted with insects that have developed a highly specialized preference for these native species. So such as native plants also support more than one species than non-native plants. Um, um, we do entirely plant native here at Reforest London, except for fruit trees. So we, um, the city of London does have an initiative for wanting to create uh, sustainable food. And so we do have um, tree depots that do offer fruit trees. So you do want to keep an eye out for those um, opportunities. All right, so the first tree that we're going to take a look at, uh, these are trees that are very special to Carolinian Canada. Uh, and so trees that are found in the Carolinian zone, you won't find them naturally occurring anywhere else in Canada because they have very specific needs um, and they are special to the zone due to the growing conditions, soil. It's a bit of a microclimate that we have here. Um, so the first tree that we're gonna look at is a pawpaw. So interesting facts about the pawpaw is that the flower actually smells like rotting flesh and can attract um, certain kinds of flies that will help spread the pollen. Uh, they are naturally occurring along railways because people would actually grab the seeds of the pawpaw, the fruit there at the top um, left-hand corner um, is said to taste something like a mango, but from experience, it does not taste like a mango. <laughs> um, so people would actually grab the fruit um, and take it on their um, railway journeys and then they would drop the seeds as they walked. Um, so these are a rare species but you can find them naturally occurring um, in southern Ontario. All right the next tree that we have is the sassafras tree. So the sassafras tree actually has lovely smelling uh, flowers and berries. It actually kind of smells like artificial fruit loops. <laughs> um, uh, the seeds also kind of look like alien antennas. A really interesting thing about a sassafras tree is it actually can have three different shaped leaves on one single tree. So the uh, leaves can be, the, sh the shape that is shown to us is like the shape of what I would consider like a dinosaur footprint, kind of like a T-Rex footprint. You could then have a singular leaf, which is just an oval shape, or it can be shaped like a mitten in the wintertime where it has just one lobe and then a larger um, a lobe in the middle. So it has three different shaped leaves, but it's all from one tree. Right. Oh, the elusive redbud. Uh, redbud flowers, um, it normally flowers early, early in the spring, way before the leaves come out. Um, it's only known to um, a Canadian occurrence was on Pelee Island. Uh, the first historical record there was uh, likely a, that a seed fell in the water and uh, that a noble had actually um, planted it. Um, Canada was tree. It has heart-shaped leaves um, and sometimes is referred to as a valentine tree. So this tree does occur naturally um, in the Carolinian zone, but it is highly sought after as an ornamental tree for people's front lawns because of the beautiful pink flowers that it does uh, produce. It does not get very tall, but it does meet that criteria of uh, 4.5 meters tall to be considered a tree for our million tree challenge. All right, the honey locust. So they have, there are two different kinds of uh, honey locusts. We have the native honey locust, which has lovely thorns. And we have the honey locust that has been um, bred to no longer um, have the needles. Um, it doesn't need the, the needles anymore. It can actually be seen as a, as a safety hazard. Um, but the honey locust um, is a great option for being planted in urban settings as it doesn't actually, it's um, salt resistant. So it does salt tolerant, sorry. Um, meaning that it uh, does a really great job uh, withstanding high amounts of salt that we uh, tend to use here in the wintertime to help de-ice a lot of uh, walkways. All right, so the Kentucky coffee tree. It has the uh, biggest leaf of any of our native trees. Um, the colonials were extremely excited to find it because they were just dying for a cup of coffee when they um, landed here in North America. It turns out that yeah, it does not produce coffee. Um, it has a very bitter um, and kind of poisonous seeds, so we do not recommend eating them. Uh, but they do have extremely hard shells. So um, 
it's a it's a very unique tree um, very long um, leaves so that entire photo at the very top from the bottom of the stem all the way to the tip all of that is considered one leaf um, which is extremely rare and again like we said the largest uh, leaf of any of our native trees all right so those are all of our Carolinian um, specific trees but when we go on our tree hike those that we will uh, do some identifying with and um, like we said the tree hike is scheduled for Thursday September 24th from 5 30 p.m. to 7 p.m. sun does start setting um, near and around 7 so we won't uh, keep you too long after that um, we would like you to uh, not necessarily meet us at the reforest London office but to meet by the Wellington building um, we will um, um, start our hike um, a little ways away from the office. We want you to um, bring trees in Canada um, if you have a copy. And we will be doing um, some ID and planting practices um, at our tree ID hike. Juliana, hey. Yes. Uh, so there was one question from Michael saying burr oak leaf. So I'm not exactly sure what he's asking, but it may have been one of the photos and um, Earlier, maybe, maybe um, I'm not sure if that's one of the ones covered in here, but um, I guess could you say how to identify a burr oak? Yeah, yeah. So burr oaks are um, we have quite a few native oak trees to the area, but burr oaks uh, are have said to have kind of like a shovel look. So they have a very large um, top to the leaf, um, and then uh, deeper lobes at lobes um, as you get down further to the stem of the leaf. Um, we do have quite a few uh, burr oaks located um, at the ESA property that we can definitely point out to you. And we can help you identify the difference between a white oak, a burr oak, and a red oak. Um, it's not covered in this PowerPoint, but it's definitely something that we can touch on uh, during our hike. Great. While I'm at it, I'll just say for the people who aren't sure where the Wellington building is, um, when you go up the hill on Western Counties Road, which is in behind the Parkwood Hospital, um, you'd turn left. So there's a parking lot to the left, um, just as opposed to going to the right where our main office is. Um, and that's just because we'll have another event going on that same evening. <laughs> um, and I, I think we have a, a few different copies of the Trees in Canada oh, books too. So we do definitely. have maybe like six copies or so, but <laughs> um, they're, they're just really great books. <laughs> yes, yeah, they're, they're very handy and they have more than what we have on the property to cover, but it's always great. To, to have a good reference book. All right, so some of the major challenges that uh, London is, does face when it comes to our Million Tree Challenge um, is 8% of uh, London is woodland cover. So remember that doesn't count towards our canopy cover number. Some of the most common species are found by stem count is actually, and by, uh, by leaf cover is actually Norway maple, which are both non-native species. So they do not count um, towards our million tree challenge. Um, not only are they non-native, but the European buckthorn is actually seen as an invasive species. So that's something that we actually want to remove um, from the London area. Um, so another challenge is that we have had masses, mass loss of ash trees due to the emerald ash borer and the possibility of losing um, a large percentage of our oak trees due to oak wilt. So there are quite a few concerns um, that we do have and some major challenges facing us when we're looking to increase um, our canopy cover um, in the London area. All right, so this is our Asian longhorn beetle. It notably eats maples and poplars to the point um, they were used um, to, um, during the sugar maple logs as a bait for the beetle. Uh, for those of you, um, it does attack some of our favorite trees, so we could lose up to 50% of our sugar maples. Um, if you see it, you, we do ask that you report um, it to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Uh, so far, it has been contained to the GTA, but the people are constantly on the lookout, making sure that it does not harm one of our largest um, exports, the, the sugar maple. All right, so the emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer has come and has done quite a bit of damage. Um, it does emerge in May. Um, it was discovered in London uh, in November of 2006. Um, at fully grown, the beetle is 8 to 14 millimeters long. Um, adults lay eggs under the bark of the ash tree. 
once the larvae have hatched, the larvae actually bore into the tree and begin feeding off the tree. So those are all the tunnels that are created are from the larvae that are feeding off of the phloem of the tree. The phloem is the woody uh, material that actually helps move nutrients from the leaves to the roots and vice versa. So that's why the animal dashboard is um, so detrimental. Not is it that the um, beetle itself, but that the larvae and the way that the larvae attack the tree, that it's extremely um, harmful uh, to the, the ash trees uh, within the London area and throughout all of Ontario. All right, oak wilt is one of our new um, concerns that we do have here in southern Ontario. It's caused by a fungus. Um, the disease does spread uh, two ways, above ground and below ground. The concern is the below ground aspect. Um, the fungus actually spreads from infected to non-infected trees through the interconnected root system. Um, above ground, uh, there are sap beetles that can carry the disease from a dead oak tree to live trees. Uh, springtime is one of the most common times for the disease to spread. Um, currently, the um, oak wilt is seen more prevalent in oak, uh, red oaks, um, pin oaks, um, black oaks, and Schudmer's oak. Um, they can actually succumb to the oak wilt disease and die in a matter of weeks. So some of the uh, key features that you can keep an eye out for if you're concerned that your oak tree could be um, suffering from oak wilt are the leaves turning almost a golden brown color similar to how they would look in fall but um, necessarily in fall you'd see it earlier than that so how can we protect our oak trees there are some really simple ways that we can protect the trees in this region we want to avoid pruning oak trees in the growing season um, as it's increase, it increases the likelihood um, of the beetle carrying the fungal spores being attracted to the tree. So if a tree does need to be pruned, uh, actually help mask the scent of the sap um, so that the tree will be protected from the beetles. Another really big uh, way to help protect our oak trees is again, do not move firewood from one area to another. Firewood can harbor disease, fungi, insects. We also want you to be on the lookout for any unusual changes. Um, oak trees should have um, their leaves in July. And if their leaves are on the ground in July, that is normally one of the... Perfect. So again, we really don't wanna, we wanna make sure that we're trying to really keep these big three simple steps in the front of our minds, avoiding pruning oak trees in the growing season, not moving firewood, and being on the lookout for unusual changes. So even though we've had a, quite the dry summer, we should drop their leaves in July. That would, that would cause for some concern. All right, so we are looking to how to plant a tree. So we want to plant the tree at the right time of year. We want to pick the right tree for the right location. the right species in the right spot. So we always want to talk about the sun. It's a big um, and important part of when you're looking at where you want to plant your tree. The sun comes from the south. So um, when you're planting your trees, uh, you can think about how our tree is going to give you shade. So shade from the buildings, shade from fences, shade from other plants. How is that tree going to be affected by the amount of shade it gets? Planting deciduous trees to the south and evergreens to the north of your home. And the question is like, why would we do that? Um, doing Planting deciduous trees to the south actually protects your trees from the hot sun in the summertime. So it can actually help lower your heating costs. And if you plant evergreens to the north of your home, it's gonna help with the cool uh, winds that we get in the wintertime. So it again, will help um, lower your, your heating costs in the wintertime. So we wanna be conscious of where we're planting our trees and, and making sure we're planting them in the right spots. So soil and water also, of course, play a big role in our planting and choosing of trees. So we have uh, three different kinds of textures when it comes to the soil. Um, we have sand, silt, and clay. So sand, uh, sandy soil, it's uh, bigger particles, it's fast draining, and it does not hold nutrients or water well. Um, clay soil, it's the smallest of the particles. Uh, it's slow draining and it holds lots of nutrients. So if you're planting a tree in sand, you want to make sure that it doesn't need a lot of water to grow. And you, uh, vice versa, when you're planting in clay, wanting to make sure that the tree 
um, does not require does not get too much water because it won't be too happy sitting in clay if it's the, not part of its requirements. Um, and then we also have uh, silt, which is that mixture between the sand and the clay. So the soil texture is extremely important. Um, helps us to determine how much and how many nutrients and how much water the tree will get during its growing season. Most people prefer a loamy soil because it's light and fluffy, but it also has nutrients. So uh, gardeners are great for testing for soil. They are really conscious of the kind of soil they have. Um, slope also affects water. So depending on what kind of a sloped area you're looking to plant your tree, um, it can either drain quicker if you're, planting, if you're planting it at the top of a slope, and it can also end up with a lot of water if you're planting your tree at the bottom of a slope because the way that the water drains, you could end up flooding out your tree. All right, and utilities. So utilities are um, a really big and important thing that we try to stress to homeowners when they're looking at getting a tree from us. Um, Ontario or ontonecall.com is how you can submit for free public utility locates. So um, it'll bring you to a, a website where you will enter your address and it will ask you to, um, you know, select the area that you're looking to plant. They will um, check for any dangerous utilities such as gas or buried electricity as we don't actually want to plant um, in or around any of those areas. Another biggest uh, reason for that is because if the tree or if there is an issue with the um, buried gas or electrical uh, that they will end up having to remove the tree and we want to have as many trees in the ground <laughs> as we can. Um, it's okay for plants to grow over them but we just don't want to be planting or digging um, in areas that could have the buried gas or buried electrical wires. All right so a little bit about how to plant a tree. So when you are looking to plant a tree, you want to make sure that when you're digging your hole, it's twice as wide as your tree is and the exact same depth as your, as, um, your potted tree. Um, messy is always better. And you definitely want to test the hole by placing the pot inside. So by placing the, placing the pot inside, you can see if your hole is deep enough and to see if the top of your potted tree is flush with the ground and also making sure that it's wide enough when you are removing your tree because your hole is ready to plant you want to make sure that you're pulling the, the tree straight out of the pot there is um oh this is the sorry um so when you remove uh the, the tree from the pot you want to make sure that you agitate the roots um you know waking them up making sure that they don't continue to grow in that circular way um if they continue to grow circular then you are going to end up uh, kind of um, suffocating your tree and it'll end up kind of um, restricting how wide and how uh, far reaching their roots do go. All right so like I said we're going to loosen up the roots uh, making sure that they are um, awake and ready to go. Placing the uh, tree in the hole uh, with the, the agitated roots uh, down first. You also want to make sure that your tree is planted straight so that can also mean that getting a partner to help hold your tree up tall while you uh, infill the, the hole with your soil that you had dug out. So you're going to backfill your um, hole, making sure you pack the soil in nice and tight. You're going to uh, kind of stamp around the outside firmly, making sure that it's nice and secure. You want to remove now. That's really important for a lot of people. They uh, sometimes that's something that they miss. Um, so we want to make sure that we remove all of those, uh, any, any twine, tags, uh, wires, anything that's labeling the tree. Um, you can keep a record of your own, of what trees you have, but you shouldn't actually leave anything that comes on the tree from the nursery on the tree after you put it in the ground. You want to add a tree collar or an O-tube. Um, we have tree collars available um, at Reforest London that we actually give to people during events um, and during park plantings to help protect the tree. Uh, and then we're going to talk about our mulch donut and watering trees. So this is called a volcano. Um, so the, the mulch is very high, close to it, then kind of spreads out, kind of like a hill. 
So we want to create donuts, not volcanoes. Uh, so volcanoes. is there keep the competition of weeds and grass away from the tree which is your culture um, locked so we also use tree collars uh, tree collars are great for uh, bunnies um, to help keep the bunnies away. Good time. All right. So again, like I said, we want to make sure that we're removing any cause what's called girdling. Um, it'll cut through the phloem of the tree, which I mentioned earlier, same way that the beetles cut through the phloem and affect the way nutrients flow up and down the tree. Same thing if we leave any twine or wire or tree tags on. So it'll affect extremely detrimental to that limb of the tree if we were to leave um, that string or wire on. All right, so how um, the bark the buds and the actual pith or checking um, the trunk of the tree. So you don't want to just look up at the top. You want to look at the bottom uh, for epicormic branching. So this is um, showing the first signs of in infect insect infestation. So they can all, so they can for about a year. Um, the top can die, uh, but the plant itself can actually re-sprout from, re from the base. So that's actually um, checking for epicormic branching. So the top can die, and then you will get, this is called the pith. So this is where you can tell if it's still green on the inside. That means that the tree is, is still um, getting nutrients and, and surviving. This is the epicormic branching. So this is very um, common in ash trees where they are the top has died back because of the lack of nutrients flowing up and down the trunk of the tree so it has started to send out shoots from the bottom to help try and get some photosynthesis going for the tree to help creating um, sugars so you want to keep an eye out um, if the tree is alive you want to make sure that you put a collar up to the leaves it's extremely important all right so you can buy lots of different kinds um, of trees when it comes to either bare root, potted, bald and burlap, or also known as caliper or spaded trees, but the, the cost really does vary. So bare root um, is seen as a, a cheap way. Um, it helps plants to adapt to its new soil, but they do have to be planted right away. So bare root meaning that their, their roots are exposed to the elements. Uh, potted, soil, uh, potted trees, their um, roots are more likely to grow in circles, which is what we call as being pot bound. Um, they are grown in potted soil, so it's hard for them to be then transplanted to clay. But they are available year round and can be um, planted um, when suitable conditions arrive. So you can keep your potted tree in the pot until um, the, a better time of year comes around to, to plant it. So they can, again, those trees can vary in cost from 10 to 30, sometimes even $40, depending on the size of your potted tree. We have uh, the next step would be bald and burlap. So the cutoff, um, when you request a bald and burlap tree, they actually cut off two thirds of the roots when it's dug up. So it needs to be wa watered quite frequently. So these are um, a lot of the trees that um, larger landscaping companies can provide, but they do come at a cost from 200 to 400 or even um, they can cost over $400. Um, they end up, um, being more stressed out when they are planted because such a large amount of their root mass is removed when they are um, removed from the fields and, and sent to be planted elsewhere. Um, in Celebration Forest, um, we can supply two potted, uh, one caliper planted at the same time. Um, the, the potted trees will then um, actually do 
just as well, if not better than a caliper tree due to the um, amount of stress it undergoes. And spaded trees are ones that actually need to be removed um, with, a, with a machine, kind of like taking a large shovel on two ends and they actually physically lift and remove the tree. You're normally getting older trees um, that don't like to be removed. So it's, uh, it's a tree that ends up being stressed out for a longer periods of time. So we always recommend buying either potted or bare root, um, depending on, on what you're looking for. And bald and burlap are great options, but you just have to remember they do tend to need a lot more care. This is our potted tree. These are bald and burlapped. And these are spade removed. So they are quite large trees um, that need heavy machinery to, uh, to move and then place elsewhere. All right, so where can you get your trees? So we do have tree depots um, that um, are happening this year. We have kind of changed uh, the way that they look, but they, we do have uh, trees that members of the public can come get for, for a donation. Um, garden centers are a great option. Wholesalers, so some of the wholesalers that, that we are familiar with include uh, and, are, and grow local stock. Um, include St. Williams, Hillens, Winkle Mullen, um, RNH Ranch, box stores like all like a Home Depot, Home Hardware, uh, Rona. They all can carry different sizes of trees. Uh, landscapers, um, and of course, you can get them from your um, local conservation authority. So the Upper Thames uh, Conservation Authority, Tree Power, Private Land Program. There's a lot of different providers that can help you get in contact with um, sourcing a tree. All right. So caring for your trees, we want to make sure that there are four W's that you want to remember to do. We want to make sure that we are watering trees uh, once a week in warmer weather. If it hasn't rained, um, is a great rule of thumb, uh, especially for the first two to three years to really help the tree get established. If you think about it, they were happily growing in their little pots and all of a sudden they've been, the roots have been agitated. They potentially have had some, um, you know, rough awakenings to, to the real world and they need to really help get established and have good uh, root structure. So water is, is extremely key um, for any tree to succeed. You also want to remember to do weeding around your trees. Um, it helps reduce uh, competition for nutrients, competition for water. Um, and we also want to make sure that we are uh, topping up the mulch. So keeping that mulch uh, donut around the tree, keeping the mulch away from the trunk of the tree and having a nice wide ring to help keep the weeds down is extremely um, beneficial to the tree in its first couple of years. We want to think about weed whacking. It's the fastest way to kill trees. So when you are looking at keeping weeds away from your tree, we want to avoid weed whacking. We want to actually pull, hand pull weeds. Um, the reason that tree collars are so beneficial, yes, they work for keeping away the mice and the bunnies and the deer in the wintertime, but they also protect your tree from the weed whacking. Um, remember, any of that damage to that outside phloem will affect nutrients and the way that nutrients move up and down a tree. And if there is lots of damage to the phloem, the tree will not have enough sugars stored to get it through the winter. And then when the spring comes, it won't have enough energy to actually produce leaves. So it's, uh, it's one way to get to not having your tree uh, make it through the winter if you uh, have a lot of weed whacking damage. And we also want to keep an eye out for wildlife. Uh, tree collars um, or O-tubes are a great way to help protect your tree. There is wildlife repellents. So at Reforest London, we do use scoot which actually helps keep deers away from a lot of um, trees that they enjoy snacking on, such as sugar maple. Um, but yeah, you do want to keep in mind that keeping your tree collar on is a great way to reduce the amount of wildlife damage that can happen. All right. So there are lots of different um, tips and tricks that we're going to uh, take a look at when we do do our, our hike. So we are going to look at soil tests, uh, taking a look at the emerald ash borer damage. We are going to be looking at European buckthorn. We will look at quality control when it comes to tree colors, mulching, uh, and showing you the difference between sugar maples and Norway maples.
All right, so we're going to talk about park naturalizations and what that looks like for a true specialist when coming to, to help out. So when you arrive at a park naturalization event, uh, you want to check in with the Reforest London staff, uh, making sure that you've got your yellow t-shirt, or if you don't have a yellow t-shirt, sorry, then a yellow vest will be provided, uh, making sure that you come with a positive attitude is always a game changer. So the setup phase, we will um, ask you to help sort um, and um, make sure that trees are dispersed evenly, uh, set out at the proper spots for planting, help unload equipment. So we normally do bring um, shovels um, to the event, filling mulch buckets and wheelbarrows as we do do mulching at our event. So not only do people plant a tree, but they also then help get the tree set up. So mulching is uh, a part of our planting. And then possibly uh, placing trees, digging holes, or um, collaring trees before participants arrive um, is always great help at park naturalization events. All right, so during the event, we're looking for quality control. So what that means is making sure that people are digging holes that are two times as wide as the pot and as deep as the pot is. So again, showing them how to do um, a, a pot test, making sure you add your tree in the pot to the hole to, to test how deep or how wide your tree is. Um, we could ask a uh, tree specialist to assist with taking photos or collecting stories from participants, uh, doing volunteer counts, actually doing a planting demo. We always start with a planting demo so that everyone uh, has an understanding of what we're um, hoping to achieve. Coloring our trees, which is adding that tree color to protect from rodents, um, adding scoot, um, or doing um, infill. So sometimes we are planting at a site that we've already been to before, um, but we're looking to kind of fill in the gap. So we may ask you to go and, and do some of that planting while the um, event is actually happening to the side. And then sometimes we do have people that trickle in a little bit late. Um, all of our park naturalization events are going to be for, you need to have pre-registration. Um, so some people may come in late and so then you can uh, demo for the people who have kind of trickled in and you can give them a little rundown of, of what the expectation is uh, during a park planting. So the first 30 minutes are extremely important for quality control, making sure trees are straight, making sure the collar is cut at the right height, making sure that tree tags are removed, and that we are making mulch donuts and not mulch volcanoes. All are, are really important um, key uh, quality control bits that we wanna make sure that we keep an eye on in that first 30 minutes. Um, so in addition to the tasks we mentioned before, we want to make sure that we are teaching um, other volunteers at the event about their tree. So it's really important that we have a good understanding of, of what we're planting in the park. Um, so teaching them a little bit about what the, the tree needs for its living conditions, what kind of environmental benefits does that tree have, what kind of animals depend on the trees that we are planting in the park. We want to help ensure um, safety at the events. So making sure that, you know, we are having shovels that aren't laying on the ground, pitchforks that are having their pointy ends sticking out, uh, making sure that people are collecting and disposing of their garbage correctly. Um, direct questions to staff as needed. So if there's a question that you're not 100% sure of the answer, you can always come to the park manager or um, another RFL staff member that's there and they'd be more than happy to field questions. And at the end of the event, you wanna check for any abandoned equipment um, garbage um, that is, is laying around. So we want to make sure that we don't um, leave scissors or um, shovels, pitchforks. Uh, we use buckets a lot of the times to help uh, move mulch around events. We don't want to leave any of that equipment behind and making sure we don't leave any garbage behind either. All right, so tree depots. Anna, so, yep, go ahead, Kelsey. For a moment, there's mm -hmm. a question from Heather. Uh, what is scoot? And then Claire chimed in and said, I believe it's a deer slash animal repellent, which is true, but I was wondering if you can elaborate a little more about how you use scoot and what is it? You know what? I haven't had a lot of a, um, exposure to using scoot. Um, so I myself, is it's something uh, new, new to me, but I know that it's... Um, extremely effective when it comes to keeping away um, modents, uh, rodents, sorry, <laughs> rabbits and deers. So you actually just like, it's a liquid uh, substance that you actually paint or spray at the trunks of trees. It's uh, non-toxic 
um, to other animals, uh, but it does um, help with the survival of a lot of trees. So it does come in, in a liquid form. I can say that I have used it a little bit. And yeah, you just get it at your neighborhood hardware store. It's this white liquid. I've just painted it on. Um, you try to avoid leaves or any new buds because it could kind of like seal the buds up. So you want to put it on the young twigs and, uh, and branches because those are the commonly eaten by deer. Um, so if you see a lot of signs of just a lot of leaves eaten off or just gone, um, that's a sign of deer brows. And yeah, like you said, I don't think it hurts the deer at all, but it just gives it an, an appetizing taste. So it'll keep them away. I think the, the yeah, absolutely, it'll keep them back. <laughs> they tend to really like our sugar maples for the obvious um, reason that there's a lot of uh, a sweet this to the, the way that a sugar maple tastes. So if we can give the sugar maple an unappealing taste, then maybe they will leave those poor little trees alone. Um, okay, so moving on to tree depots. Um, so arrival time is extremely important when it comes to tree depots. Um, this year, the way that we are, you can meet staff 45 minutes or half an hour uh, before the event time in signup.com, that's always appreciated. Um, we're going to have a uh, volunteer sign in, um, making sure that you check in with the park manager um, or our depot manager um, to get instructions on like how the day is structured, um, helping to unload the trailer. Uh, so luckily, the way that our depots are running this year is that um, the trees are already going to be sorted in our compounds. So if you've ever been to Reforest London, you have um, large areas that are kind of uh, gated in uh, next to the front of the building and um, a lot of our species are, are stored in there. So the setup is, is quite easy because they are already going to, going to be sorted by species. Um, so we're going to make sure that there are spaces between the rows, making sure that, that um, pots at the front, uh, smaller pots are at the front, larger pots are at the back. Um, helping to put up the species signs are always great. Uh, making sure that we add tags, removing any um, uh, stakes that don't need to be there uh, and keeping customers um, so the way that keeping customers back from moving plants until inventory is done would be if we were doing our traditional depot mode which is people will show up 10 20 minutes before the event and they kind of line up waiting for tree depot trees and for their their turn to select the tree depot trees uh, the model that we are going with due to covid is people need to actually pre-order so we will be emailing out availability lists of how much we have of each species and as people log in they will select up three trees that they are interested in a, a setting aside for them for um, a donation fee and then they will arrive at a specific time so they are then given um, different time slots to choose from and they are expected to show up within their vehicle at the designated time they drive up we kind of like take attendance and ask them to confirm um, the trees that they've requested and be like, yep, those are the trees that we have set aside for you. And then we relay that information back to a tree specialist and they will then go into the compounds and pull um, the trees that were requested. And then we actually don't load the tree into the vehicle for them unless they kind of require assistance. We place the tree um, at the designated pickup spot and the um, recipient will then hop out of their vehicle and load the trees into their vehicle. Um, so at a normal tree depot, pre-COVID, um, tree specialist volunteers actually help each resident in the line pick out a tree. So you will kind of be paired up with someone asking them about the uh, conditions of their backyard and what they're hoping to achieve. Um, the limit is normally two to three trees per household um, as long as they reside um, within the city of London. And we ask them to fill out a tree recipient form, which allows us to kind of um, input the information uh, for them into the Million Tree Challenge uh, website. We give them a take-home information and tree collar package so that they um, understand, you know, the, the care needed for their species. Lots of people will get three different species and not be 100% sure on the care and maintenance for each species as they do differ. Um, so giving them a take-home information package um, is really important um, so that they have all the tools ready to succeed and help keep that tree alive in their yard. And then we always encourage them to donate. Um, without the donations to the program, we wouldn't be able to continue to offer tree depots. So donations are always so wonderful. Um, 
you because we are going this pre-order method people can actually donate when they order their trees before the event so we are i'm sorry on the reference sheet if they have donated to make sure that we thank them because it's really important to us that without the donations um, we wouldn't be able to offer these tree depots to the residents of london so at all events, we uh, want to make sure at whatever event a tree specialist is attending, making sure that other volunteers are learning and having fun about the trees. So we always like to give people a little bit of background information on what kind of animals trees support, what kind of uh, vegetation they do well with. I'm encouraging people to always participate in the Million Tree Challenge. So making sure that they um, register any trees that they've uh, gotten through us or anything that they've purchased through in box stores. Um, and talking to someone um, about a potential project. Um, I, I currently am taking over the planting projects for Reforest London right now. So if they have any questions about looking to get a planting event happening at their workplace or looking to get involved in an aftercare event, um, they are more than welcome to uh, get in contact with me um, at an event. All right, so a lot of common questions that you may get at an event. Uh, what are these black spots on my maple? So these are tar spot disease. It's actually just a fungal infection. It affects all types of maples, but Norway maples do seem to be um, hit quite hard. Um, there's actually little effect on the tree's health, which is a great, great thing to tell people because people always assume that their tree is dying and that it's like toast. Um, but it's actually just, it's a fungal disease, like we said, and it's just kind of unappealing to look at. Um, the fungal spores actually uh, fall from the leaves in the spring. Um, the best thing to do is to actually rake up the leaves so that the fungus does not continue to, to fester in that area. So again, not detrimental to your tree, just not very nice to look at. All right, so do I need to cut down my ash tree? Um, so the uh, emerald ash borer currently is affecting ash trees, um, which are true ash, which they come from the Fraxinus genus, so they're not affecting mountain ash. Um, the hope is that your tree is a resistant tree, so you want to make sure that um, you, you could get lucky enough that your tree could, could be resistant to the effects of the uh, beetles and the larvae, but it is 90% plus are actually expected to, to die because of the disease. Um, you want to keep an eye out for brittle and falling branches. If your tree does exhibit brittle or falling branches, um, then that is a uh, cause to, to possibly have the tree removed. Um, but if someone does uh, is looking to have more um, intensive care, they really care for this tree, the tree is really large and it's like a, a very important tree to them, they can look at being uh, treated with trees and is one of the, the options. But again, um, as Reforest London, we always do encourage people to, if they have a concern about their tree, to contact an arborist, um, someone who is certified in looking at tree disease, tree pests, um, and they can give them um, a much more concrete answer. Uh, photos can only tell you so much, right? So we always want to encourage people that we can try our best to answer questions for you, but if you're looking for a definitive answer, that we encourage them to contact a local arborist to, to come and have their tree assessed. Okay, so why are these three gallon plants the same height as the one gallon plant? Um, we get a lot of that um, at, at events. Um, so some species grow at different rates, uh, depending on um, the pot size, depending on the soil requirements. Um, some trees require larger pots while still very small. Um, a great example would be our bitternut hickories. Um, they are, are extremely slow growing, but uh, have a taproot, so they do need a larger pot to, to suffice um, their growing needs. Uh, and sometimes plants will grow more um, in girth, so their trunk will uh, grow quickly as opposed to their height. So it's just important that you express that to people that it's not like the three gallon tree is not sickly, um, even though it's small, um, it's just the type of tree that is, is grown and, and planted in that pot. But once you plant it in its appropriate um, growing conditions with the right soil, the right amount of water, proper sunlight, the, the tree will um, adjust and, and grow as it should. Okay, so some of our other uh, programs that Reforest London offers for tree specialists do include our tree cycle program. So our tree cycle program is when 
members of the community actually drop off trees that are growing in their backyards and they have no use for the, the tree if it's growing in a in a bad location or they're just not too sure if the tree fits in their yard. We actually ask members of the public to dig up their tree uh, and put it in a pot and we will be at the office to receive those trees. Those trees then can actually be recycled um, and used in our some of our park planting events, um, making sure that those trees uh, fit the site requirements, that, the, that the, the site has the right soil, the right amount of water, the right amount of space for those trees to be placed. We then will um, use them in our park plantings and we really appreciate the support from the community um, for the tree cycle program. So we do have aftercare programs. So aftercare programs do typically happen May um, through September. We had quite a few of our um, aftercare events in July and August this year and we are going to hopefully be continuing aftercare um, into September and potentially into October um, if the weather allows. So aftercare um, allows us to go to past planting projects looking to do some tending to those trees. So normally trees that we've either planted um, in the spring or in the previous fall, we will uh, go back and revisit um, and we will mulch a lot of those trees. So we will weed around the trees that are in the ground. We will um, bring uh, buckets with us and we ask that tree specialists um, assist in filling the buckets. Um, a lot of our volunteers that come out to aftercare programs from the community uh, don't know much about a tree. So they're more than happy to have someone teach them a little bit about, oh, you know, this tree is actually a maple and, and show them the difference between a maple and a tulip tree. They really enjoy um, that extra bit of, of information. So any help from a tree specialist um, at an aftercare program is always appreciated. Um, we also have celebration forests. So normally it would be the second Saturday in May. Due to COVID this year, we have bumped it and it is this coming weekend. Uh, so we have uh, three different days that we are um, doing celebration forests. So celebration forests is an event where people can actually purchase trees to plant in memory um, of, of a loved one. Um, so we are hosting Celebration Forest uh, this Thursday and then the Saturday, Sunday. And uh, it's, tree specialists are a great uh, option to actually help people who have never planted a tree before um, take the tree that they're planting for their loved one and, and take the time to teach them how to plant a tree um, in our memorial forest that we do have at Reforest London. And then tree specialists also may a small series of um, public hikes and hike leaders are a great option uh, to uh, help um, add some extra info to, to the hike. Our hike leaders um, have a wide array of knowledge but tree specialists are also great because hiking in a forest you can help us identify trees and, and teach the public um, about the beautiful trees that we do have um, at the area that we would be hiking at. So uh, other uh, learning opportunities that uh, you can keep an eye out for include the seed collector. Uh, so becoming a seed collector, you can actually earn money uh, collecting seed, um, which, is, which is just a great opportunity. Um, you can uh, get involved um, um, ELC certified, so ecological land classification uh, certification workshops. Um, they, those are offered through Conservation Ontario. Uh, Field Botanists of Ontario is a a great group to, to kind of familiarize yourself with. And the Guelph Arboretum offers lots of educational opportunities um, to kind of teach um, and wants to en engage with the public. So that's a great opportunity for a tree specialist to kind of uh, soak up some more knowledge. All right, so I feel like that has brought us to near the end of our presentation. Um, so where do we go from here? We do have our tree ID hike uh, coming up September uh, 24th. So you wanna make sure that you pre-register for that because we are limiting the amount of people that can come on that hike. If we do have a higher interest, we uh, will look at offering um, a second hike. There will be a, a tree ID quiz that we will do. Um, you will receive emails with, a, with event dates. Um, there will be a feedback survey that Kelsey will provide. And there is um, a tree specialist uh, 201 session um, coming next year. So you want to keep your eyes peeled for that. So uh, we do have a guard. Yes, Kelsey. There's a question from Heather saying, where is the Memorial Forest in London? So the Reforest London uh, Celebration Forest, if you are driving up uh, Western Counties Road and you kind of pass the speed bumps and you continue up 
and you are heading up the driveway towards that blue um, gatehouse is what we it has our maps and like our vision of uh, the western counties it's on the right hand side of western counties road on the west side of the road it's um, a large planting area that um, Reforest London and uh, St. Joe's Hospital have kind of worked on together. Yeah, so it's um, hospital property that they actually kind of donated to us to plant on. And a fun fact is that if you put Celebration Forest into Google Maps, it actually pops up. So you can see it if you do that. Oh, that's super fun. I, lo I, I love when you learn the things. You're like, oh, did you know? You can just find it on Google. Um, yeah, so uh, we do have some volunteer appreciation. So trained Corps volunteers um, receive an I Dig Trees t-shirt after one event. Um, after 15 events or 30 hours, you do receive a tree gift or a tree. Um, after 30 events or 45 hours of volunteering, you receive a MEC uh, gift card. After uh, one month of volunteering, you will be featured in our volunteer spotlight, which is um, in our a reforest funded newsletter. Um, we will have a top volunteer award, which is recognizes the top three uh, volunteers at our annual uh, general meeting, which is you need to participate in over 45 plus events. And then if you participate in over 75 events, there is a customized award that you will be awarded with. All right, so thank you so much for uh, uh, flying through our uh, Tree Specialist 101 uh, PowerPoint with us. We uh, normally, again, deliver this in person, so this is a first for doing it uh, virtually. So thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, again, you can, yeah, you can reach me at julian at reforestland.ca if you have any questions uh, about any of our park plantings that are happening, any of our aftercare events, um, or about our tree depots. Um, Kelsey uh, Nichols was our, was, uh, our uh, introdu she introduced our presentation today and she is our community manager so you can reach her at uh, volunteer at reforestsouthern.ca. Um, the office right now is it's closed to the public but you can reach us um, via email uh, so please do reach out if you have any questions. We will be having our plant planting dates and our tree depot dates uh, posted to the website shortly. We're just kind of firming up some of the last minute details. So keep an eye out on our Facebook page or on our Reforest London website. Uh, the newsletter is also another spot with upcoming dates that you uh, want to keep an eye out for. Juliana, uh, something I didn't do at the beginning, but maybe we could do it now before everyone heads out is uh, do the polls. So we just wanted to poll uh, and get some feedback from you guys to see if you have volunteered with us before and uh, if you've done the orientation training. So Juliana, uh, as the host, you have the ability to do that. Oh, okay. Well, we will see if we can uh, get this working healthy. <laughs> yes, throughout COVID, we've experimented oh. with different uh, platforms. And with Zoom, I've realized you can only have one person be the host at a time. Okay, so the first poll that we're going to launch is, have you attended a Reforest London orientation? So I will be launching the poll. And if the poll is now live in your uh, chat area, so if we could just have a little bit of feedback. Perfect. Oh my goodness, look at those numbers climb. Awesome. All right, so we've had 80% of people have responded. So I will give it just a couple more seconds. So I can mention, so we ask that people complete the orientation um, as well. It's technically the prerequisite for this training. Um, if you haven't done it yet, you can always do it after the fact. Um, and maybe in our follow-up email, I'll like, even send out um, the recording to the latest session in case you haven't done it or um, in case you want to watch it again. So we did it a week ago or last week at some point, and um, now it's on YouTube, but um, it's you only gain, gain access if you have the link to it. So I can share the link with you guys and then you can always get the training that way. All right, so we've had, um, pretty much everybody has voted and we've got 71% uh, have answered yes to attending the Reforest London orientation and just under 30% um, have said no, they have not. So in that poll, 
Perfect. So we will. All right. Relaunch polling. Oh, no. We already did that one. Is there another one, Kelsey, that you wanted me to? Yes. You just... click on polls. There should be a little uh, drop down arrow where you okay. can use the other poll. Yeah, it's not super intuitive. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. <laughs> so poll number two is, have you ever volunteered with Reforest London before? So some of you may have volunteered with us in a different capacity, but not necessarily as a tree specialist. So we're just curious to see what other roles people, um, if you have volunteered with us before in another way. Perfect, so we've got 86% of people have voted. We'll leave it for just a couple more seconds. All right, closing poll, sharing results. So 68% of people have volunteered with us before, so welcome back. And 32% have not volunteered with us before, so welcome to you. We look forward to having you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, we have a couple of questions and keep them yeah. coming because um, there's lots of time. I mean, I guess we'll head out if uh, they really slow down, but um, in sure. the meantime, a um, couple of people are asking about gypsy moths. So what mm. do we know about gypsy moths? Um, so bad. C F K E N said, um, is there any plan to try to pick the egg nests from the trees? So um, I actually have an answer to that. Yeah. Um, if you'd like. So um, through the Signal Boost program, we hold a lot of educational webinars and things like that. And um, we're in talks with uh, the City of London to hopefully offer some training um, in the fall for how to, I guess, yeah, remove the, the egg nests um, that are on the trees. So hopefully, it's still in the works, but hopefully soon there will be news about um, a, a kind of training or a webinar uh, that will probably be followed by some educational hikes where you can join and we'll show you how to do it. Um, so I've heard that all throughout, like starting late August all the way until um, the spring, you can remove those um, eggs from the trees and then that will greatly reduce, you know, the numbers the next year. Um, the City of London also has like a news page on their website. So um, if you just type into Google, um, Gypsy Moths, City of London, they actually have um, a, a whole web page dedicated to how residents can actually help monitor and manage Gypsy Moths on their own properties. So it was updated June 15th of this year. So it actually um, can take you through, you know, how to identify Gypsy Moth, um, how is the city managing the Gypsy Moth population, and what residents can actually do to help protect their private trees um, and property from Gypsy Moths. So they do encourage um, homeowners to handpick um, gypsy moss from smaller trees and plants to um, transposition, uh, transposition uh, burlap wrap trees so they can grow larger in the summer. Uh, once the gypsy moths are captured at any stage, they do um, encourage you to dispose of them uh, and consulting with a licensed contractor to explore biological pesticides or tree injection options um, are encouraged um, because gypsy moths can be so detrimental to, to tree species. Cool. I also just saw that the Invasive Species Center um, put out a webinar recently, and I just watched it last week. So if you look up, um, yeah, it's called the Invasive Species Center, and if you look up Gypsy Moth webinar, you can watch a whole webinar about just that topic. Perfect. Get your fix. <laughs> um, Michael asked, do you have a favorite ongoing naturalization project in London? Ooh. We're taking on a new project this fall at Bristol Woods, which is part of another ESA, which I do think is like super exciting. Um, there's a lot of buckthorn on the site. So the more that we can get some naturalized um, and native trees in there, that'll kind of help stop maybe the effects of the buckthorn. So I'm looking forward to that as an upcoming project. Kelsey, do you have any, any projects that you're looking forward to? <laughs> Oh man, I, yeah, I should say, uh, Julian had just kind of started being the project manager too, so I'm glad you had a, <laughs> an answer to that. I was ready. I'd say it's hard to pick a favorite. I have one in my neighborhood, and so I like going to visit it, so the park, and I just like being able to check up on the trees, but 
I think they're all pretty even. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good answer. <laughs> uh, so Charles asked, do Japanese be beetles cause issues to newly planted trees? If so, what does RFL do to prevent the infestation? So like you said, the Japanese beetle is kind of um, lower on our priority um, as, as an issue um, within uh, London. Um, it's, it's a, it was an issue that was contained primarily to the, the GTA. Um, so as Reforest London, we actually aren't exterminators by any means. Um, so if you do see a Japanese um, beetle, we, uh, we encourage people to, to capture them. I know that there are Japanese beetle traps, but it's not something that like we um, specialize in ourselves. Um, so they do sell Japanese beetle traps at like Walmart, K Tire. So if you're looking to kind of discourage them from munching on your, your plants locally, um, otherwise, again, contacting the city and letting them know that there may be is an infestation central area pretty hard or hitting a local park, um, the city might be able to deploy some, some resources to help assess and, and treat the area. Um, but as Reforest London, we don't really have um, a big role to play in managing um, the beetle and its, its infestation currently. That's the best I got. Yeah. So Lori mentioned that she picks them daily and tosses them into soapy water. Um, I had heard that it was more in Toronto than in here. So um, because a big part of what we do is education, it's definitely good to hear <laughs> if they're around here. Um, and then I think it was somebody asked if we could share more information about these kinds of other topics like invasive species. Um, I should mention that on our website, go to reforestlondon.ca and then click resources. There, there are quite a few um, different resources about all kinds of tree topics from how to choose the right tree from, for your yard to um, a page about different invasive species in the area and what you can do about them. Um, so I will actually uh, post that in the chat so people can access that. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's always hidden kind of on our on our website, but we do have quite a bit of online resources um, at reforestlondon.ca. So if you do take the time just to kind of pan through um, and and see what's available there, um, it might just take. You can shoot us an email by by any means, please. Uh, if you can't find something um, a resource on our website, uh, just reach out to us, and we'd be more than happy to navigate you in the in the right direction. bit of a conversation going on about uh, trapping them. Someone said they're north of Sunningdale and oh, no. Valley Mott Woods and um, Springbank Park and so. Oh, my mom does the soapy water trick. She goes around to her garden and, and it tends to be that if you put your soapy water container under the leaf that the beetle is on and you tap the leaf, they actually just like kind of drop in so you don't actually have to touch them, which is uh, a lovely benefit benefit if you're not a, an insect person um, but yeah you can just place your soapy water cup underneath and have the beetle fall into that so i guess i can reiterate the next step so i'll send out a follow-up email that has the recording of this and the link to sign up to the hike and um yeah so everything will be in the email perfect and then if you ever have any other questions yeah contact us and just uh, again, if you want to stay up to date on any of the, the planting events or depot dates or any aftercare events that we may need help on, signing up for our newsletter um, is always a great way to, to keep in contact or following us on Facebook. We are quite active keeping our um, dates and events uh, up to date on, on Facebook is really important to us. Actually, another thing that I forgot to say that I was going to say was that um, we're really, really close to uh, publicizing the uh, planting dates and depot dates, but for the tree specialists, um, the sign up calendar for that is coming out even before we can publicize it. So that will oh, yeah. out like by tomorrow. So mm -hmm. I can send that yeah. to you guys. Technically you need to still do the hike in order to become the official um, tree specialist, but once you do, then um, I will email you on an ongoing basis um, anytime. Uh, there are opportunities for tree specialists. So they have their own kind of separate calendar that's 
you know, private, it's not accessible to anybody else unless you get that link. So um, you'll get on that exclusive tree specialist email list. Yahoo! Well, I think we definitely flew through the content of that at a, at a good pace. The tree hike is definitely more of the hands-on, um, getting to ID stuff, looking at bark, um, leaf shape. Um, so I know that I'm really looking forward to, to the hike portion of this training. Yeah, and it goes without saying, but if you do uh, come to the hike, just make sure to wear a mask and um, we'll try to maintain physical distance as much as we can. And like we said, we're, we will be meeting everyone um, at the Wellington, um, so the larger kind of yellow building, because we do have an event happening at Reforest London at the office uh, on that same day. Lisa says, very excited to volunteer with RFL for the first time. Yay! Bring yeah, it's it a great on. time to do this training because we have a lot of events coming up right now, a full slew of fall events, and um, we didn't really do a whole lot in the spring. We didn't do any public planting events because of all the uncertainty and the freshness of the pandemic, so um, we actually weren't sure until very recently about what was going to happen this fall, so luckily some uh, funding kicked in and we were able to host these, these events. All right, I guess um, the questions have stopped coming in. So Juliana, if you're okay with that, maybe I'll just close this out. Thank you so much again for uh, sticking with us, for coming out to this training tonight, for listening in and um, have a great night. Thanks guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>